In the third part of this lecture, we talk about Hooke's law and elastic symmetry. Here is an example application. Uh, assume in the case of asthma, the airways cross section reduces, causing difficulty in breathing. To model this, uh, we can uh, simplify the 3D geometry to a 2D geometry and then calculate the stress and the strains. Then we can uh, generalize the uh, results to the 3D case. This is what we are going to discuss in the rest of um, this session and um, followed by discussion in the next lecture. Let's start with the basic concepts. Uniaxial test. Uh, we mean compression or tension, and it's performed on a material sample to characterize its constitutive properties. Assume uh, the tensile force F applying on a uh, cylindrical sample with cross-section A. We uh, may observe reduction in the cross-section. And... Plotting the stress versus strain, uh, we get a linear portion for moderate loads and a curved part um, that uh, is related to plastic deformation. Uh, we identify yield points or yield stress as uh, the transition point between the linear uh, elastic and nonlinear plastic uh, deformation region, and we may get a fracture uh, stress as well. Uh, this is the plot for ductile material, like alloys or metals. Okay, if F is in the x1 direction, uh, then in the linear part of the graph with curve slope E. We can write sigma 1 1 is equal to E epsilon 1 1. That's how we relate the stress and uh, strain align x1 direction. And that's the Hooke's law. Um, so let's um, see the plot for uh, uniaxial loading and unloading for different materials. Uh, in, in the case of linear elastic behavior, uh, we have a linear plot uh, and loading and unloading um, happens uh, on the same plot. In the case of nonlinear elastic behavior, uh, we have a curved plot, but still the loading and unloading happens um, on the same path. In, in the case of inelastic behavior, uh, we have a curved loading path and a curve or a, a, a linear unloading path. And uh, you see there's an area underneath uh, and the loading and unloading uh, paths do not coincide. Um, the area of that uh, enclosed region is called hysteresis and that shows the dissipated energy in the process. So for a linear elastic and nonlinear elastic, uh, regardless of the behavior of the material, we don't have any energy dissipated. Um, but in the inelastic case, uh, we have some uh, dissipated energy uh, due to hysteresis. Let's look into Hooke's law uh, in more details. We have the stress strain uh, curve here. Uh, with the uh, linear part slope uh, as E, and we've already uh, identified the yield stress and ultimate stress. We don't care about that at the moment. Hooke's law is the most elementary description of material's behavior. A stress and a strain are linearly related through constant E, which is Young modulus or modulus of elasticity. In the unaxial tensile test, E determines the curve slope for the linear part. And we all, we've already seen that um, sigma is E epsilon. Um, we can define a strain energy density 
which is a strain energy per unit volume um, as W, it's basically the area underneath uh, this curve. We can calculate it as half of E epsilon square. According to this definition, we can say that the stress is partial derivative of a strain energy density uh, with respect to strain. So partial W, partial epsilon. And in general, for possibly nonlinear elastic materials, we can say sigma ij equal to partial W, partial epsilon ij. So the ij element of um, the stress tensor uh, is calculated based on this relation. Um, then we can um, write the generalized Hooke's law, the most general linear relation among all the components of the stress and a strain tensor. Uh, just know the um, free ij and summation indices kl in this equation. So we get sigma ij is equal to uh, c ij kl epsilon kl. Um, C here is a fourth order tensor. Note that S stress is a second order tensor, S strain is a second order tensor as well, so we need a fourth order tensor to relate them. Uh, for the S strain energy density, we can write it as half of uh, C i j k l epsilon i j epsilon k l. This is the generalized Hooke's law compared to uh, the case of uh, uniaxial, um, um, uniaxial tests. Again, note the uh, KL, which is a summation index. And if we expand it, we get basically sigma ij is equal to cij. And uh, we have to do the summation over KL. That's uh, the expanded form. Here is an example. Um, it says drive the generalized Hooke's law, uh, sigma ij equal to c ij kl epsilon kl from quadrated strain energy function w. Um, you have two hints. First, c is symmetric, so uh, c ij kl is equal to c kl ij. And we have um, partial epsilon ij, partial epsilon kl equal to half of uh, Kernecker delta um, ik uh, delta jl plus uh, delta j uh, delta il delta jk. Let's see how uh, we can use these two hints to drive the generalized Hooke's law. We start with the strain energy density uh, function. Uh, w is equal to half of CKLMN epsilon KL epsilon MN. Now, I, I just chose KLMN here. You, you, could, cho you could choose any other um, index. Then for the uh, stress strain relation, we already know that it is sigma ij equal to partial uh, W partial epsilon ij. Let's uh, replace W into a strain uh, stress relation. We get sigma ij is equal to partial um, half of sigma kl mn epsilon kl epsilon mn uh, over partial epsilon ij. I just bring the um, half of C K L M N out and uh, bring a partial partial epsilon ij in. I get partial epsilon K L partial epsilon ij and similar on the other side. Um, okay, we can use uh, the second hint that we already have and it gives us sigma ij is equal to half of CKLMN uh, delta KI delta I, 
delta lj epsilon kl plus epsilon kl again delta mi delta nj so basically i just um, use the second hint that we have and replaced it in um, this equation okay um, let's uh, simplify this equation knowing that delta ki means that k is equal to i for example and similar for the rest of the Kernicker deltas we get um, we get half of um, c um, ij mn uh, epsilon kl know that uh, i said k equal to i and l equal to j Um, so epsilon kl because epsilon becomes epsilon mn for the second part we get epsilon um, we get ckl ij equal to epsilon kl um, now we use the second hint uh, using symmetry uh, we know that uh, well uh, sigma uh, cij mn uh, we can just replace mn with kl doesn't matter so it's equal to uh, cijkl but then from the symmetry uh, we know that it's equal to cklij so basically these two uh, are equal considering that we get basically sigma ij is equal to cijkl epsilon kl and that's what uh, we wanted to find okay uh, generalized Hooke's law, some properties. Um, C is a fourth order tensor with 81 components describing material elastic properties. Due to a stress and a strain tensor symmetry, uh, we can uh, basically um, assume uh, most of uh, these components are equal it reduces um, C to 36 distinct coefficients. And then uh, we already know that total strain energy W is invariant to the order of the occurrence of deformations. So the final deform deformation energy uh, doesn't care if, uh, for example, the first deformation or deformation along the first axis happens before or after the deformation along the other axis. Um, as a result, we can say that um, uh, partial 2w, partial epsilon ij, partial epsilon kl is equal to um, partial uh, 2w, um, uh, partial epsilon kl, partial epsilon ij. It simplifies C uh, even further and uh, we end up with only 21 independent coefficients. So, um, the uh, fourth order uh, tensor C is now uh, can be written as a second order tensor um, uh, in this form. So um, here we have the independent element um, of uh, a stress. Here we have the independent elements of uh, a strain tensor, and uh, we. We are only left with uh, 21 independent coefficients and this uh, 6 by 6 uh, matrix, 6 by 6 second order tensor. And know that um, the, um, this part of the tensor is equal to the other, um, other part. This is the symmetry. Okay, if the coefficients are constant, the material is homogeneous. Uh, and depending on the material properties, C can be even more simplified. We're going to see that later. Isotropy and anisotropy. If a material doesn't possess properties of symmetry, it is called an isotropic material. And C um, are 21 independent constants. 
If symmetry about one or more planes or axes exists, the number of independent co coefficients c can be reduced. By enforcing more symmetries, we can decrease the number of c independent coefficients from 21 for an anisotropic material to just 2 for uh, an isotropic material. Um, we have these types of symmetries. Um, fully anisotropic, there is no symmetry, uh, so we get 21 independent constant in C uh, tensor. Monoclinic material, um, it has one symmetry plane. Uh, as a result, uh, we get 13 independent constants. Uh, orthotropic material with three symmetry planes. Um, as a result, uh, now we have only nine independent constants. Transversely isotropic material, uh, we have three symmetry planes like orthotropic uh, and one axial symmetry. Uh, so we get five independent constants. Then cubic material, it has three symmetry uh, planes and 90 degree rotations uh, between these planes. Uh, so we are down to three independent constants now. And finally, if we have full symmetry, we get an isotropic material and it has only two independent constants. We're going to uh, know about them more later during the lecture. I'll look into that. Isotropic materials. Isotropic materials, um, so uh, body elastic properties are the same in every set of uh, reference axes at any point for a given situation like a uh, temperature or loading condition. So basically it doesn't matter how you define your reference axis and where you define it, you still get the same um, um, properties uh, for, the, uh, for the material. Hence you get the same relation between a stress and a strain. Uh, as a result, the constitutive equation, um, sigma equal to C epsilon, uh, has only two constants, two independent coefficients. And uh, assuming the um, symmetry, uh, it reduces the 21st constant that we identified uh, in the generalized case uh, to only two constants that we call um, Lame constants. Uh, they're usually uh, represented by uh, lambda and mu. So, um, Hooke's law for an isotropic material um, can be reduced to um, this relation, sigma ij is equal to lambda uh, delta ij epsilon kk plus 2 mu uh, epsilon ij and uh, note that kk is a, a summation index so the expansion looks like this and uh, the um, expanded form for the constitutive equation uh, becomes sigma equal to, uh, as you see, um, we have two mu plus lambda for the first uh, three diagonal elements. Then we have two mu for the last three diagonal elements. And uh, for only um, a few of the diagonal elements, we get lambda for the rest of them, it's zero. And here we have symmetric elements. Uh, we can uh, have uh, the Hooke's law in terms of a strain. It's a kind of inverse relation, um, which is epsilon equal to C inverse sigma. And that's how it looks. Epsilon is equal to uh, 1 over 2 mu sigma minus uh, lambda over 2 mu uh, multiplied by 2 mu plus 3 lambda uh, delta ij sigma kk. Again, um, Note that kk is a, uh, a summation index. Uh, 
and a material uh, that is not isotropic is called an isotropic. We're going to talk about it more later. Here is an uh, activity example for you to try uh, before starting the last part of this session. Uh, it says for an, uh, for an uh, isotropic uh, linear elastic solid show that uh, first the principal axis uh, and um, of Q of the stress and straight tensors coincide. So we get the same principal axis for both stress and strain tensors. And second, um, develop an expression for uh, the relation among their principal values. So uh, epsilon of Q and sigma of Q uh, find their relation, uh, where Q is 1, 2, 3. Uh, here is a hint for you. Use the fundamental equation for the eigenvalue problems. It says uh, epsilon or sigma ij uh, n of q is equal to uh, epsilon of q n of q or sigma of q n of q. Um, good luck.